Welcome everybody, whether you already the student who signed up for this course, whether you're thinking about signing up, uh, signing up for this course, or uh, you're just a guest and uh, you guys are thinking of maybe just to receive some kind of useful, valuable information for your trading uh, about the Wyckoff method or the trading itself. So welcome, welcome. Uh, for those of you who are going to sign up for this course, uh, so uh, make sure that you go to wyckoffanalytics.com, Wyckoff Trading Course Part 1. You can just find it very easily. If you can't find it, contact Nancy at wyckoffassociates.gmail.com and she will be able to answer any of your questions about the signups, any type of situations that we have, any type of payments, any type of um, uh, questions regarding the administra uh, administration of the course. So um, please contact Nancy. Um, 12 sessions, not 15. Uh, so usually summer uh, course is uh, three sessions less. Uh, that's just our preference for the summer. So therefore um, our cost is somewhat less. And uh, I want to point your attention, especially for those of you who are already alumni of WTC1, uh, and there are quite a few of those uh, that inquired about the alumni rate. So please make sure that you secure that uh, rate. So uh, contact Nancy and you could definitely receive that. And also for those of you who prefer the monthly payments, so three recurrent payments of 283. Um, and um, if that's convenient for you, uh, please do so. Uh, our sessions will last into July 7th week, uh, so each week, Mondays from 3 to 5.30 Pacific time. I also would love if we would have this conversation right now with students who already signed up or somebody who's going to sign up. I, uh, our course is going to be uh, done as any type of courses in, at, at college level or university, university graduate level. You will have the lecture, you will have the homework, and then we will discuss the homework uh, in the next class. So all of the homework assignments should be, submit, should be submitted only in one file. And the format of that file should be either a PowerPoint, PDF, or Word doc. Uh, this is very important uh, to us because uh, it, saves me time going through your homeworks. And yes, I do go through your homeworks. Um, I also would like in the title of the email when you send me the homework uh, for you to identify the first name with the last uh, name of initial, what course this is and what homework this is. Uh, so in this is going to be easier for us to sort through uh, all of your emails because as you could imagine we receive quite a lot uh, so uh, different classes different questions and so on and so forth um, this particular recording of this session and this is a very common question um, is it uh, is this session recorded yes it's recorded will it be po posted yes it will be posted on youtube uh, uh, like of trading method it's our channel uh, please check it out and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. Uh, for those of you who are students, all of the recordings and slides will be uh, made available to you today, tonight, after this session. It usually takes about two to two and a half hours to encode the session, to upload the session, to put it on the website. Uh, so there is a specific sequence. Uh, you will see the slides on our website and you will also see the video for this uh, session. Uh, you will also receive an email with an access information uh, to that particular page. So just look into, uh, uh, for that email. And if you have not received it, check uh, your spam or junk folder first before you contact us. Usually those end up there. All right, really quickly, this is just a collage. I was just uh, playing around with this. I'll go through different products uh, that we have, but you know, I just want to say that we've kind of grew, uh, grew somewhat substantially. Uh, I'm very proud of our team uh, talking on different subjects of trading and specifically of Wyckoff Method. So what would I highlight here? Well, obviously you're here for the Wyckoff Trading Course, part one, which is the analysis, part two, execution, I'll talk about of the curriculum of part two in the second Wednesday class, Wyckoff Market Discussion with Bruce and myself. 
Uh, it's quite an interesting class. Check out the free session that we had uh, a week and a half ago. This is the discussion of the work uh, uh, of the not just the market, but the application of the Wyckoff method uh, in, uh, for any type of assets. Uh, Wyckoff tapering lab, uh, which I conduct with uh, William on Mondays, is very much in-depth advanced uh, chart reading uh, class where we use uh, volume spread analysis, swing analysis, uh, and just all of the techniques, all of the possible techniques that we could uh, use uh, in tape reading or chart reading. Uh, we are going to have a, an exciting special, uh, which is just three sessions, uh, which is going to start on May 3rd, and, and that is going to be conducted by Gary Dayton, our friend and colleague, uh, White Coffin, and we've worked with, Dave, uh, with Gary for quite a long time. Uh, we are very excited that uh, Gary has a, a agreed to conduct a special for us. It's going to start on May 3rd, so check out our website. Wyke of Market Report, uh, report just a recent uh, rendition of um, the report that has been going out already for more than a year. And John has done uh, such an excellent job, and I'll highlight this a, a little bit more, of scanning Wyke of structure and delivering the weekly uh, screening results to you. Uh, so check this out. Wyke of crypto discussion and Discord, which is led by Alessio. I'm just only there for the weekly discussion, uh, the video that we create on the weekly basis. So for those of you who are into crypto trading uh, and Wyke of methodology, this is the place to be. Each Friday, uh, we uh, publish the communal Wyke of watch list. This is the uh, watch list that has been created by students and curated by me. Uh, so, and it's free, completely free. You could find it on our website and uh, it's on stock charts. Uh, Wyke of bias, case, uh, bias game, extremely popular game that we play each week on our Twitter. So check this out as well. You could find it on our website as well. And the anatomy of the trade, uh, which is the series um, on the post-trade analysis of our uh, students. So check those out. As usual, everything that we discuss here is for educational purposes, so please stop your recording and read the disclaimer in full. Uh, let's talk about the curriculum that we're going to have for this semester. Uh, so we have only 12 sessions. The first uh, four sessions are going to be devoted to market structural analysis. What's important in this uh, part of the knowledge? Obviously, one of the things uh, that is going to be very, very crucial for us to identify is well, what is the price structural environment that we are in and how could we identify that? How could we identify the changes between, let's say, a trend and non-trend? How could we identify the change between a non-trend, which is a consolidation, to a trend? Uh, so therefore, a discussion of the change of behavior and change of character is going to be very essential. That's going to be also... Uh, uh, you know, uh, go into the price structure analysis of the Wyckoff events and Wyckoff phases. Uh, it's an extremely important material uh, for Wyckoff community to understand how Wyckoff events happen, where they happen, what do they mean, what are they part of, or what kind of bias, whether accumulation or distribution. And then Wyckoff phases is all about timing. Timing of uh, when is the price ready to leave the trading range or to uh, get into the trading range. So uh, unfortunately, um, I would love to, to go through this discussion on market structural analysis after the supply and demand, after the volume and price analysis. But we need a foundational understanding of how the price structure unfolds. And only then we could go to the volume and price analysis where our predominant conversation is gonna be about effort and the result. This is probably one of the most important concepts in uh, Wyckoff method, and I would say like in, in the whole chart reading, even trading, how do we assess what the price is doing relative to the effort that the market participants are showing behind that price movement, and what does it mean uh, uh, for the future of the, uh, of the price movement? We're gonna do a lot of bar by bar analysis, uh, which is the volume spread analysis, swing by swing analysis, uh, we're going to go through a very systematic uh, action sequence exercise uh, for a whole month. This is where 
uh, a lot of concepts on effort and the result are gonna be introduced where there is gonna be a lot of discussions, case studies on the volume and price analysis. We're gonna talk about uh, how volume patterns affect the Weica phases or trends. Uh, we'll talk about some historical analogs related to that. Session number nine and 10 is gonna be related uh, is going to be devoted to relative and comparative analysis. This is uh, something that a lot of you know, but we, again, for me uh, as a teacher, it's important to set up a very strong foundation uh, of the basics of what the relative and comparative analysis um, are and how do we go about this from the WICA perspective. Plus, we're going to give you somewhat of the proprietary material like sweet spots of the outperformance, the sequence of outperformance that lead to the outperformance and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about filtering and scanning as well. Session number 11 will be uh, devoted to the execution uh, or trade management. I will talk about the entry points, exit points, stop losses, and, it's, and their placement uh, and movement. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about scaling in and scaling out of the positions. Uh, this is just an intro to a much bigger discussion that we would have in Wyckoff Trading Corp uh, course part two, uh, which is the execution. Uh, we also will discuss the Wyckoff Trading Plan under the trade management. And as usual, last session will be devoted to the Q&A um, by students. Okay, so then the next session that I would advise you to attend, if you can't, if you can't attend, just sign up for that. It's going to happen tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific, and then you will receive an email with the link to that recording. This is uh, Wyckoff Trading Court Course Part 2 execution, and there we just go in depth uh, into the advanced Wyckoff analysis where we are discussing specific phase behaviors, where we look at different variations of the volume signature, uh, trend analysis, um, how we're using modern uh, TA tools uh, in conjunction with Wyckoff analysis. And more importantly, we will be discussing uh, the significant bar um, analysis, which is uh, somewhat of the proprietary thing that we develop at Wyckoff Analytics. It discusses the uh, significant bars in the relationship to their tests and to the, uh, the swings that is being developed and to the trends that those swings and those significant bars establish, and also swing analysis. So this is something that we've been doing for the last probably five cycles, and uh, this definitely uh, you know, takes our understanding of the methodology, understanding of the chart reading uh, to a very, very deep level. Also, as I always say to our students, knowledge is not the skill. I mean, this is probably should be already uh, like uh, put somewhere in front of everybody's, uh, you know, uh, in front of every student, uh, because I could see a lot how many people that come to us uh, have been hoarding and are still hoarding the knowledge. Uh, so in their understanding that if you have more knowledge, then you will trade better. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, like, at least from my experience of being a teacher for a long time now, uh, and this is cycle number probably 35, 36, 37 that I've been teaching this material. So you can imagine, I've been around and I've seen people uh, and I've seen how people study this material or any material uh, uh, around trading. In a lot of cases, uh, hoarding of knowledge is common and psychologically could be explained by uh, you know, kind of like this withdrawal and flight to what is perceived by quality. But in reality, this is just a flight away from the actual work that needs to be done. And what is the actual work that needs to be do, uh, done around trading or the trading analysis that uh, would propel you to, let's say, the next step, the next level? Um, and it's all about uh, practice. And it's all about drills and exercise. And that's exactly what we do in WTC part two. So for those of you who are interested, check it out, free session tomorrow. At least get the feel of the directionality of the curriculum and the directionality of potentially your involvement uh, with this uh, knowledge and with this material. Today, uh, we are going through the introduction. Um, 
our homework, so the first homework is going to be Jim Fortis Anatomy of the Trading Range. This article has been published uh, by Jim, I believe, in 1996 in MTA Journal. Uh, uh, I was uh, a student at Golden Gate University in the same class uh, as Jim as he was writing this, uh, I believe, CMT3 level uh, paper. I consider this the best article on price structural analysis by far. Uh, Hank tried to do this, you know, other people tried to do this, but Jim's article is just eloquently describing uh, everything that we need to know about the price structure. So this is a really good uh, foundation for us to start our conversation on the price uh, structural analysis. So please read this. I'll come back to this in a second. As usual, each class is going to be a part of each class is going to be devoted to the market update where I'm going to go through the major uh, assets like, you know, stock market, Bitcoin, oil, gold, um, yield, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you how I'm applying applying uh, Wyckoff method uh, for my trading and for my analysis. And then Today we're going to go into the uh, introduction of the material. We'll talk about who Wyckoff was. What's this uh, mysterious composite operator, composite man type of um, heuristic that we always talk about? Um, how does Wyckoff uh, apply to the price uh, cycle model? And I'm going to introduce you to the behavioral market analysis, which is um, basically the analysis of market participants in, at the specific price structural points. We'll talk about strong hands versus weak hands, institutional hands versus retail hands. Uh, we'll discuss all of the market participants and then we'll go through some case studies uh, just um, to kind of go and to prove our point about the price cycle model. Session number two, for those of you who already signed up or you guys are going to sign up, we're going to go into the depth of our discussion of the price cycle. We'll start talking about the change of character, change of behavior. Uh, we'll talk about the accumulation distributional schematics. We'll talk about the traits and characteristics of the reaccumulation, redistribution. And then we'll start talking about the phase analysis in terms of the like of events and the timing of phases, what they mean, and so on and so forth. Your second homework is going to be intense. I'm going to give you around eight slides with different uh, uh, trading ranges, and you will have to label those. So kind of a serious course. This is not something where you, if, if you really want to advance, you you will have to go through the homeworks, but you could definitely go through the course as an observer as well. Just let me know, like I'm an observer. So I, you know, I'm just going to listen in and uh, this is going to be my role. Uh, and this is also fine. Uh, I mean, I would rather somebody to go through the course uh, just as an observer than not to take the course because at least you will get the knowledge. Maybe occasionally you will do some homeworks. And for those of you, and I know that there will be people who's going to be extremely active, you guys are going to send me your homeworks. You guys are going to uh, keep continually asking questions. Uh, you guys are going to um, uh, have some questions for our last session and so on and so forth. And this is uh, a driving force behind each life class that we have. These are the people who are asking the questions that are on your mind. So we always have a mixture of different people, different students, and I appreciate you know any uh, type of participation that you have. Again, if you have any questions about the course, you know, email us, email Nancy at wikofassociates.gmail.com. We'll be happy to answer those. Here is our first homework assignment, again, for students. So for those of you who are going to sign up, Anatomy of the Trading Range by Jim Forte. As I said, um, I consider this the best article that was written on the price structural analysis. You can find it on our website, but I will also upload this article to the uh, class page. For those of you who are signed up, you don't have to find it unless you want to uh, do this right away after the class. Um, so you'll find it in on the class page. All right, let's do our market update. Uh, so this is the usual screen that I'm going to have on the top. Uh, you could see four 
uh, stock market indices, S&P, NASDAQ, uh, Russell 2000, and the Dow. Uh, and then at the bottom, we have different type of commodities like gold, we have Bitcoin, we have oil. And currently I have the 10 year yield just to see where we are uh, with the Fed and with the yield in general. So let's start with the S&P 500. And obviously, you know, this is gonna be a very similar picture to NASDAQ, to Russell somewhat, and to the Dow. Uh, so right on this bar right here, our call was, um, and if you would like to check any of our calls that we make, uh, because our company's policy is to be as transparent with our calls as possible. Uh, whether this is a free call, you know, whether the one that we're publishing on social media like Twitter, uh, check out our Twitter handle, like of analysis, or this is behind the paid wall. Uh, you know, we are definitely uh, extremely transparent. Uh, and I think uh, that's the key for the uh, business that we are in. Our students need to see how we are thinking about the market, what our analysis is, and then to see what actually happens afterwards. And we definitely could be wrong and we analyze our mistakes. So we're not hiding when we are wrong. Now, the latest sequence uh, of events that started to happen in uh, last November actually was pretty favorable to us. On this bar in particular, we said that we are going into a trading range that will increase volatility, that would be suggestive of the distributional nature, and that will lead to some kind of major sign of weakness. So this type of sequence was you know, identified absolutely correctly uh, on, uh, on this particular day. So we are going into the trading range. We are increasing volatility through the reactions. Uh, we said about this reaction that it was not that great uh, just because demand was decreasing and it felt like you know, we were in the second point of excitement by weak hands where weak hands are just um, you know, uh, advancing this rally into the end of the year, which also seasonally uh, a correct rally to have at that point. But starting with this particular bar and specifically with this break to the downside, this is where uh, our call turned more into the distribution. And what I call that was, uh, we are uh, going down uh, uh, in a major sign of weakness with the local stop in action as the climactic action uh, that is being followed by the automatic rally, suggesting the secondary test afterwards. And then we are creating the trading range. We're creating the trading range with different boundaries. There is a boundary at the selling climax, at the automatic rally. Then there are also boundaries at the upthrust, spring event, and the test. And then we were waiting for this rally for quite some time. Um, even at the spring event, we were saying that we're gonna rally, we're gonna rally, and we're gonna rally as the best rally in this trading range. Now, the key to this rally, and it still is, is overcoming the point of the breakdown, which was right here. So 4,600 is an extremely important level, not just to overcome temporarily, like we did here in the upthrust, where we temporarily commit into the upside just with one close, and then almost immediately coming back into the trade range. This is more of a failure rather than a true commitment to the upside that would uh, suggest a, you know, uh, a bullish behavior. And even though we still consider this a change of behavior rally, a change of behavior rally will always need to be confirmed by the reaction that is bullish. Well, so far we're seeing uh, how supply is increasing and there is a little bit of an ease of movement to the downside that we see on the breakdown bars. There is an attempt to stop here and we had some of the intraday trades that we had around the area of the stop in action. Uh, those were profitable trades, but those were intraday trades. They did not, the price did not allow us to switch to a high time frame uh, and to start thinking about the structure in a different way. So what is the most important 
couple of things here for us to observe. Well, first of all, we need to understand where are we going to stop with this downswing, right? So imagine if we stop here, imagine that this local spring on a very short-term basis actually materializes into some kind of rally. So what should we be seeing if the rally unfolds? Well, we definitely want to overcome specific short-term levels of the resistance and specifically this bar. This was the last significant bar to the downside. This is where the commitment of sellers is to the downside. This bar also takes us below the support that was created by the automatic rally, a very important point. So if we're gonna see some bar that reverses the current downswing like this and breaks a short-term downtrend, then we would say that now we are in the reversal mode and we're expecting some kind of rally. We'll have to see what kind of rally we have, but at least initially we're gonna comment that this is a higher low, stop in action, and we could have the potentiality of maybe a consolidation and continuation to the upside. Now this, did not happen yet. I'm just talking about specific scenarios. If this scenario happens, the next big confirmation is an ability of the price to follow through to the downside. And after that, an ability of the price to overcome 4,600 level. The overcoming of 4,600 level would be the final confirmation of the bias. And from the downward bias that we have had and that we are still currently in, we could say that we have switched uh, to the bullish bias for sure. Now, before that, there are quite a few trades that you could still take, right? It's all up to your selection. Uh, how would you go about this spot? Would you be looking at some of the outperforming uh, sectors, industry groups, and then find stocks um, around those? And that those would be your trades. And this is how we teach our students to go about any of the swings in the trading range. And specifically when you define the bias already, when you confirm the bias, then you could most definitely uh, you know, have um, a better understanding of the correct selection. NASDAQ. Uh, so we're definitely weaker than S&P. Uh, that is being reflective. Um, with the initial uh, distributional range, with the initial major uh, sign of weakness that undercuts the previous low, a much deeper uh, sign of weakness, uh, which comes as a spring event and a test. And then there is no upthrust right here. There is just a failed upthrust. Uh, therefore, a weaker structure will always have deeper reactions. So we're close to the support here. Same story here. Could we stop here? Could this diminishing supply signature be suggestive that now we could rally? And it seems to me that we are trying to do that. We are somewhat in the vicinity of the local trading range where we could start producing some kind of attempts to go up. Again, what would this attempt mean uh, if we rally above the level of the resistance that is being defined by the short-term uh, points of interest for us? For instance, the last significant bar. If we could overcome that, that again would mean that we are reversing uh, the current short-term trend and that potentially we could have a rally. And we will have to see what kind of character of the rally we're gonna see. Uh, whether the confirmation comes over and whether we could commit above the levels where we've been rejected before. That's ex exactly what we would be looking for. Russell, so a very interesting uh, story here just because the structure is so big. Uh, so usually people would uh, tell me like, oh, this is, uh, this is the distribution, the whole thing. Okay, well, if this is a distribution, uh, here's your homework, uh, take, a distributional account using the PNF horizontal account and count it from here to here. And then count from here, this is gonna be your most aggressive count and uh, count you know, to the buying climax. Where would it take you? And I guarantee you, because we already done this, it will take you to below zero. So therefore the question becomes, is it really a distribution? Could it be that the distribution uh, was divided, this trading range was divided maybe into different parts. And here's my argument. If you would just look, uh, let's say, even into this area right here, how would you assess the bias, not knowing what's gonna come here? 
because when you know in hindsight it's very easy it's very easy to look at this and just you know make some kind of you know screaming judgment uh, of the specific call but when you actually start thinking about you know why um, would we let's say call this area right here an area of the reaccumulation where uh, there is definitive signs of absorption of the supply, where we see that the price comes and quickly reacts around the support. Um, and that at the point of the apex, uh, there was a suggestion for the breakout. Now the breakout happens and it's being negated almost immediately by this bar. So the question to us by Coffins uh, becomes is where exactly the distribution is because we are clearly here in the downtrend. We are still in the downtrend by the definition of the trend. Lower highs, lower lows. That's the conventional TA definition of the downtrend. So we have had a change of behavior bar and with that we're seeing immediate increase in the volume signature. We're seeing how supply is coming in and this is where institutions are starting to sell. So there is this concept um, in um, in the methodology, which might not be even known by some of the practitioners, because the usual definition of the bias, whether accumulation or distribution, is a horizontal trading range that has those elements of the distribution or accumulation. Here, distribution happens on the way down. And this is very significant, so I'm posing here, posing here so that it, it would get to your minds that uh, distribution specified and identified by the emergence of the supply. I mean, like think about the distribution, what is it? It's the institutional selling that produces the increase of the volume and increase of volatility and increase of the downward result. We don't have it here. And that's the whole point here. Well. Case studies like this, obviously, we'll we'll study and we'll talk about this. This was, um, you know, our call here was to the upside, and then once we came to this bar, uh, our call was to the downside. So our call is still to the downside until we're going to see a much more definitive uh, change of behavior and change of character uh, in Russell. And for that, again, we need to overcome first local resistance. Then we need to overcome this bar right here. There was an attempt to do that, but we are up thrusted. So now we are, in, we are in need on Russell to overcome this level. And only after that, we would say that, yes, there is a final confirmation that this is a reaccumulation bias. Until then, we are still in the redistribution, which needs to be confirmed or to fail. And that's the process that we are going through right now. I mean, there is a specific analytical sequence that we've uh, created for our students where going through the trading range, they, um, you know, almost like uh, point by point identifying uh, the background, the bias for that background, uh, changes of behavior and changes of character. And we, uh, with that, this is how the definition of the bias actually comes. We also develop different scenarios, and, you know, for us to mentally be prepared and to understand uh, what is needed, let's say, for the bullish scenario and what is needed for the bearish scenario. Uh, so, in reality, the bias definition becomes uh, somewhat easy uh, at some point. Okay, um, what's next? Let's go to gold. Yeah, there are quite a few questions about gold because a lot of you guys have been involved in gold for years. I've had the long-term campaign position since 2019. I've had some short-term trades as well. My long-term campaign position since 2019 is still on. It's in my IRA account, I don't touch it. Uh, it's a cash position. I don't really care about that because there are definitely some uh, PNF targets beyond 2000. And when the, uh, gold was at 1200, Nobody believed that we're going to go to 2,000. We were showing this. Nobody believed uh, that we're going to go to 3,000 or 4,000. But PNF actually shows that uh, there is quite a lot of causality behind the original um, accumulation range right here uh, in, since 2013 to 2019. By the way, that 2019 call 
was somewhere here, I believe, and here. So those were the original places uh, to open the position. Uh, what's interesting here is that the most current one uh, definitely overcame the old all time high. Um, and this is what I love to see when the price overcomes this level. Up thrusting, it breaking out in a significant way, and then holding in the upper part of the all time high. Now, this trading range in itself uh, has a complex structure. I'm only going to talk about a change of behavior here that was followed uh, by what? By a series of reactions where we see the increase in the uh, level of selling. And it's an extremely important point for us to understand what happens with the downward effort. So we're seeing how supply is diminishing and at the same time, downward result is diminishing as well. Each time with each reaction, we're seeing some kind of contraction of the result. And we are seeing more higher lows uh, going into the potential apex. So from here, our expectation is that the character of the move is going to be uh, of increased velocity, increased momentum. We're expecting uh, the upward spread is increased. We're expecting that we are going to overcome the levels of the resistance. And our target was 1950. And actually, I did have a trade here. Um, I did this trade in futures, gold futures. So these were the points of entry, point of entry number one, point of entry number two. Um, first exit was at our 1950 target. So this is exit number one. And then the second and third exit were all about, you know, the change of behavior bar right here. So. Uh, we started closing at, um, I actually believe there were two or three exit, uh, exits around this area, so two and three. Um, so this is a swing trade, and that was the intention of this trade, and therefore that was a leverage trade. That's why I was using futures. And this was a really good trade uh, in combination also with the cash position that I have, which is a long-term campaign. Uh, so this position was done, and what I didn't like about the way how the price was behaving is that at the new all-time high, we are barely touching it. We're not overcoming it. So therefore, we have uh, a weak point number one. We have a change of behavior that is quite deep, quite aggressive, and there is a lot of supply here. So that is suggestive of what? Of more ranging action. and. You know, we'll have to see whether we could hold here in the upper part of this trading range in order for, for us to say like, yes, uh, indeed, uh, you know, we are gonna have a continuation. So there is a lot of here that is under development, but basically the definition right now of the trend is a trading range consolidation. And therefore we are uh, commenting on the swings right here. Okay, silver is somewhat weaker. And by the way, one more thought on gold. Um, the question is why gold is weaker right now, let's say. Uh, why is it not coming out of this formation? Well, it's all about the dollar. So with uh, all of the geopolitical events that are happening, inflation and so on and so forth, uh, there is a flight of safety to the dollar. Uh, dollar is still probably, you know, has some upside to around 28, and that puts the pressure on gold and uh, on silver. Okay, let's go to oil. Um, and uh, there were quite a lot of, uh, you know, great analytical pieces that we've produced around this trading range just because this is what we're all about, just looking at the price movement, whether in the trading ranges or in the, in the trends and just commenting, analyzing those. Uh, so uh, even though there was some kind of expectation of the reaction, we went into the climactic run so buy and climax, automatic rally. This is the trading range that is being defined by uh, by the current price action, uh, secondary test, phase A. So currently we are in phase B, and phase B is all about uh, the exhaustion of the result of what has happened in phase A. Uh, so uh, ups and downs here, I think that the best 
uh, trading strategy here is just short term, meaning that you know trading the swings up and down and those, uh, if leverage, uh, could be quite profitable. Bitcoin. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit more data here. Uh, so I, I've actually, uh, surprisingly, you know, our our students and specifically Alessio uh, got me into crypto trading uh, too late uh, in 2021. Uh, so uh, I think that we've started somewhere here um, or around this area. So still to the upside, and as we go through this top information. Our call to the downside happened on this bar right here. So here we're saying, you know, to the uh, our call is to the downside. Uh, there were a couple of trades here to the downside. I think this call was uh, pretty nice. You know, we called for the what I call a stupid bar. So we said that in one day we're going to decline at least 10,000 uh, 10, uh, points. Uh, that happened, and then on this particular day. Uh, we said that this is our uh, point of entry. This was an actual trade. Uh, there were uh, quite a few point of entries um, later on. So this is the second point of entry. And then the exit out of that was this bar right here. So you kind of could see maybe, you know, some of you with the trained eye, you could see where our calls are, right? So we are allowing the structure to unfold until the last point where the confirmation comes that that's it. We are actually going to have acceleration to the downside, and we are currently in the downtrend. Uh, meanwhile, there is quite a lot of discussion in classes as to what is happening uh, during the trading range. Um, uh, we usually uh, come up with our bias definition a little bit later on, uh, just for you know the purposes of the um, uh, announcement. Uh, to the world that this is our current analysis. Um, and then our points of entry to the upside in this trading range were here, specifically, you know, in this testing area, this testing area, um, and there were uh, some exits, all right? So some trims here, some exit here. So currently, uh, this is still under the question of, um, could we actually rally from here? And I think that Bitcoin is positioned uh, somewhat similar to the market action. So let's just zoom in a little bit. And we're seeing how this reaction uh, definitely has some momentum to the downside. We see those breakdown bars and they're breaking down uh, with a lot of strength. Uh, so to us, uh, on the background of the downtrend, the bias is still down. We needed to overcome 46 and to hold there. We just because of this break to the downside, and we need to overcome also 52. So the long-term trend is still uh, not confirmed, uh, just because the price always fails around this area of around 46. So until we stop behaving this way until we actually overcome this area and we there's going to be a, nothing bullish about this uh, so uh, we need to obviously trade short term which we've been doing so all of this is tradable uh, just as a swing trade and um, for the short term uh, swing reversal from let's say downswing we need to see the overcoming of this area first, right? So could we have this? Then we're gonna say that finally we have reversed. A bar like this, where demand signature from the bars to the downside uh, that are reversal bars. Uh, so something like this, maybe something like this. Uh, we are seeing that demand was you know, somewhat significantly high. This is the lowest reversal demand that we have. So this is a little bit of a suspect. And until we actually commit above 42, I wouldn't necessarily call this um, a reversal. We just need more confirmation. But if this call comes, then you know we would be swing trading to the upside with an, with an idea of uh, how would this rally unfold? Where would it go? What kind of character of this rally would we see? So still in the trading range. Okay, with that, this concludes our market analysis.
If you have some problems with the audio or the video, just log off and log back in. All right, uh, let's come back to our slides and to our material. Um, Wyckoff market discussion, as I mentioned, an application um, of the Wyckoff method on uh, trading and just the analysis uh, conducted each Wednesday with Bruce. Those are quite enjoyable sessions for us um, as you know we get together as the community as the big community um, it's a, it's a relatively big class where students ask a lot of questions send their charts uh, for our analysis but predominantly we discuss two things we want to understand the market market analysis uh, for that particular week and uh, we also uh, would like to discuss the stock selection and it's not that we are discussing just stocks um, uh, we definitely, you know, from time to time, go and discuss any type of commodities. You know, sometimes students bring in some, uh, you know, currency pairs, forex pairs. Uh, we definitely discuss, you know, Bitcoin or you know those major uh, uh, cryptos like you know Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, so quite an interesting event, uh, weekly event. Uh, check out uh, our free video from a week and a half on our YouTube channel. And that will give you a really good understanding of what we do there. And then uh, in conjunction with the uh, Wyckoff Market discussion, Wyckoff Market Report, uh, where John is going through the scanning of uh, different Wyckoff events. And this is what's so interesting about this newsletter. Uh, so different scans identify different Wyckoff events. And then on the weekly basis, we could even quantify those events and identify the breadth of the market. So quite remarkable. Also, uh, there are some tables that I'm not showing here with the actual stock selections um, based on this week of events. Uh, so you could uh, go and identify like, okay, I, I want to identify the spring. I want to identify the upthrust. Uh, what are those candidates? So. John does this work for you on a weekly basis, so check it out. Let's talk about Richard D. Wyckoff. Well, Richard D. Wyckoff was a very interesting figure um, in the marketplace in the early 1900s. Um, you know, uh, and uh, his bio uh, biography uh, is somewhat fascinating. I would uh, highly recommend uh, a piece in the Stocks and Commodities by Stella Asoba. Uh, Stellar had um, wonderful uh, different pieces on Wyckoff and Jesse Livingmore, uh, and we invited her to the Best of Wyckoff conference uh, in 2019. She gave a wonderful talk. Uh, we still have that on our website, and it's a free material right now, so please go uh, and find it um, in on-demand section. And uh, would most definitely recommend Stellar's work uh, on the biography of uh, Richard D. Wyckoff. Uh, he was, uh, to me, uh, probably the most influential in the way how he codified, how he converted uh, the companion ideas by the stock operators of that time uh, and showing those ideas uh, in his writings, in his courses to the public. That's, I think, his uh, biggest contribution to technical analysis just in general. He was an editor of the magazine of Wall, uh, of Wall Street, uh, which ended its existence uh, in 1974. There is uh, kind of like a sad story that his second wife uh, sued him after the divorce and you know uh, got the possession of that particular magazine. Uh, that was probably the worst trade that he has done you know, his whole life. Uh, and uh, just, I, I truly believe that that has pushed him uh, to create uh, his course uh, for the public. Uh, but again, one of the most important things that uh, he brought to the public is this documented way of how uh, a lot of stock campaigners or just the uh, campaigners at the time, like Jesse Livingmore, James Keen, JP Morgan, how they operated, what was behind their uh, market logic and how they were conducting their campaign throughout the whole price cycle. And that's what we are so grateful uh, to R.D. Wyckoff uh, for. Uh, he also introduced uh, the term 
composite operator or composite man. And we'll go into uh, an article that was written by him in the magazine of Wall Street, and we'll identify specific, you know, paragraphs on the composite man. So we'll talk about this. Uh, he was a prolific uh, educator and writer as well. So his first, uh, you know, type of magazine or uh, a digest uh, was the Ticker. Uh, so pretty interesting that he had access. Uh, to quite a lot of interesting names like uh, William D. Gann, uh and some others. This is from 1909. Um, he also was publishing a newsletter. Uh, he wrote a lot of books, uh, and you could find those books uh, on Amazon. Um, uh, some of them uh, could be in the public domain. Now, a lot of students ask me uh, the question of, well, which book, which like of book would you recommend? I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend the books that Wyckoff uh, wrote himself. Those are not systematic uh, books in terms of the knowledge, how it's being given to you. This is something that we recommend um, uh, for our students, to our students to read after they have gone at least through the first course, um, just to get more comfortable uh, with his writing. Uh, there are some other books like Hank's book, which is the requirement for this course, uh, specifically chapters three to seven. There's David Wise's book, which is extremely important for, for us to read as well at slightly higher level. And there are some other books that you could find on our website, including the book uh, Train Monthly by uh, Gary Dayton, who's going to have this special in May. Um, I mentioned the magazine of Wall Street. Uh, so he was, you know, quite prolific writer and had, you know, uh, a uh, you know, a big business to run that was not only educating but also helping people to uh, navigate the markets. I believe at some point he had um, a subscription over 200,000 people, uh, which is mind-boggling uh, when you think about this type of number at that type of time um, compared to, you know, let's say like what we have right now. This is the uh, his original course that was uh, published around 1931, 1932, 1933. Uh, Wyckoff passed away in 1934. Uh, so then uh, the whole operation uh, was given to his uh, apprentice, uh, uh, Bob Evans. We are grateful to Bob Evans and the whole lineage of the SMI that allowed the method to live, to exist. And then uh, there were quite a lot of people that came to the methodology that actually not only sustained the method itself, but also improved the method. And this is our goal as a company uh, in this field, in like a uh, method field, not just to sustain the knowledge, but actually improve it. Now, this is something that you could read right away, but also it's a little bit outdated. Uh, and again, my preference always is for the you know, intermediate students to read this content after our first introductory course. Let's talk about the uh, composite operator. The composite operator is the heuristic. So it's 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 real, but it was uh, you know put together by uh, Richard Wyckoff as a concept, and he described it in the magazine of Wall Street uh, himself. Um, and we specifically will concentrate on this paragraph right here. Who is the composite man and where can he be found? He consists of some 2 million personalities scattered around the face of the earth. So probably at that time, this was the approximation of the number of traders around the world. Some of his component, uh, component parts are richer, so really wealthy people, more powerful, than others. So he's talking here about some stock operators, you know, like JP Morgan, uh, Jesse Livermore, somebody who is a uh, who is rich and has uh, some kind of, you know, maybe like you know Wall Street power or some deep knowledge about the market. Some are noted for their foresight, intuition, shrewdness, conservatism. Um, this is analysts. Uh, some for the dashing daring, reckless quality of their moves, speculators. Uh, these millions of personalities form one omniscient who sways the market, crushing those who do not know weekends. 
and will not learn how to benefit by him and crown it with profits and income those who do by coffins. Okay, so if you have studied the method without coming to us, your understanding of the composite man most likely is going to be, and this is how I was taught, so this legacy uh, uh, training that we have had needs to be redone. We need to be retaught a little bit. Not every institution is the composite man, period. Just get it out of your head. They, there are institutions that are making mistakes because they are people. And if you are an institutional uh, trader, that doesn't necessarily automatically mean that you're a composite operator. Warren Buffett, which we bring up you know, uh, very often as an illustration of the modern composite man, makes mistakes. All right, so you should feel good about you making mistakes. Well, if Warren Buffett makes mistakes, then if I make mistakes, then that's okay. Um, secondly, uh, there was this notion that, okay, what if we go further? And not all institutions are the composite man. Uh, in some instances, they act as a composite man if they are on the correct side of the price cycle, and in some instances, they don't. Okay, great. Uh, but what about other people uh, that participate in the market? What about analysts? What about uh, speculators or professional traders? What about the public retail hands that are on the correct side uh, of the price cycle? All of them together create this heuristic, uh, uh, you know, composite man heuristic. Um, and I was so happy to see this piece. This came to me a little bit later uh, when I um, came to this conclusion that in, if you're an institution, that doesn't mean that you're the composite man. And our concentration should be more on weak hands and strong hands, where weak hands could be both institutional quality and retail quality, and also strong hands could be of both institutional and uh, retail quality. Uh, but his original thinking here about the composite man and composite operator obviously was uh, related, focused on the stock operators of his time. And that's understandable because back then, more than 100 years ago, um, this man had enough uh, monetary power to uh, accumulate a substantial supply of stocks and then campaign that supply into the higher prices and then distribute that supply at the higher prices. Um, so therefore, uh, you know, it was very appropriate uh, to think about them as stock operators, to think about them as the composite men. Obviously the legislature has changed uh, in the last hundred years significantly. Uh, so we cannot have this type of one single man type of campaigns, unless you're in the low liquidity stocks, you're using social media, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, currently, what we have is a herd of institutions that will be on the correct side of the price cycle, and uh, some herd of the institutions that for some other reasons will be in and out, will be on the opposite side, uh, just because of their bad calls, and they will not be the that you know uh, ultimate composite man. Uh, buys game. I've mentioned this. Um, please check it out on our website. Uh, you could play the buys game, which I think is a very essential uh, educational tool for us and for our community, uh, where uh, you are given the chart. And then you are asked to vote whether this is an accumulation or a distribution, and then you are given the solution. Now, why am I saying that this is an extremely important educational tool for you on a weekly basis? Because you instantly have the feedback uh, during the week as to how you do. And we are publishing not just our labeling, but our understanding of the Wyckoff story what has happened on this chart and how would we define the bias and at which points. You could also come to our website and go through all of the bias games that we have had um, since, you know, almost like two, 
no more than two years ago, almost three years ago now. Uh, so we have around uh, close to 140 uh, bias game, uh, bias games, and uh, I would highly suggest uh, for you to go and figure out how to do this on a weekly basis, and then how historically just to go through this game, um, and on our website uh, just increase your skill, uh, skill of visual recognition, skill of uh, bias identification, and so on and so forth. All right, so what are the main objectives for our price structural analysis? First of all, it's the observation of market participants' behavior on the chart. This is very important. This is the combination of a couple of things. Observation in itself, and you know what I'm noticing uh, uh, being a teacher for a long time now is that we, people, I'm not saying just generally traders, but just as people, we are very, uh, uh, we have very poor observation skills. Uh, I'm gonna ask you right now uh, a question to prove my point. Uh, you're probably sitting right now either in your office or in some kind of room in your house, uh, you know, or maybe in the office. Can you tell me the number of objects that you have in that room? Can you tell me the number or maybe books that you have there? Could you tell me all of the colors of the uh, walls around you or uh, the things that are around you, the colors of those? Can you tell me, um, you know, such silly things like, you know, how many pencils do you have on the table? How many books do you have on the shelf? And majority of us will not be able to do that because, you know, we just really, really lack uh, that uh, multiple data observation skills. It's just our minds, uh, you know, it's hard for our minds to capture a lot of data at the same time. Now think about the chart. What do we see on the chart? We see a lot of data, which has to be structurized uh, in such a way that it would make sense to us so that we would be able to make the analysis. And based on this data, and based on our analysis, we could say, or at least we could propose, speculate, what different market participants are doing. Are the strong hands buying or are the strong hands selling? Are the weak hands being inactive or they are excited? Um, and it's this ability to read the chart in the behavioral way uh, that makes a huge difference in our chart reading in general and then in our trading. But that's not all. I mean, one thing if you are able to observe what is happening on the chart, another thing is to be able to make correction, uh, correct deductions uh, about what uh, different market participants are doing. Uh, because in a lot of cases, uh, if we take something specific like volume signature, volume is very deceiving because it doesn't necessarily show you uh, the levels of supply and the demand. And it also, uh, in a lot of cases, does not necessarily correspond correctly to the price action itself. You could have the increase in the effort, which is the volume signature uh, in itself. And then you could have the decrease in the result, which is the price action. What does it mean? Um, so we will go into some definitions of, let's say, uh, like effort versus result, where we are looking at the effort um, in conjunction together with the price action. One of the biggest mistakes that I see in students is just to emotionally be attached more to the volume signature. And if the volume signature increases and there is some kind of anticipation that supply is coming, there is some selling, there is all, almost like this unconscious push to close the position without looking at what the price is doing with this type of the uh, increase in math. And this is just a specific example. Uh, so you have to make correct deductions about your correct observations. And then the third one is definitely just execution. You have to trade alongside the smart money. So you have to see them. You have to deduce what that smart money actually uh, does, you know, what kind of intensity, uh, intentions they have, and then to try uh, to execute alongside uh, with that. How would we study? Uh, this analysis. So obviously we're going to start with the price cycle. The price cycle is the higher level vision or concept 
uh, for the whole uh, Wyckoff method. We need to understand that the price moves in a specific way, specifically from the area of accumulation through the uptrend into the distribution and then into the downtrend. Uh, we need to understand behind this price cycle model uh, the behaviors of different market participants. So therefore, we've come up with this term, behavioral market analysis. Uh, this is not necessarily behavioral finance, although very close. Uh, we do not uh, necessarily concentrate on just the psychological aspects, but uh, we bring a lot of psychology into the price structure itself. Why are specific market participants increasing their effort or increasing their volume at the specific structural spots? So it's a very, very important uh, concept for us to understand. Uh, trend analysis, we'll partially cover it today, but we'll have more on this uh, in this course and then later on in the practicum. Um, how does the trend develop? What are the different stages of the trend? What are the different be behavioral characteristics of different market participants in trend? Uh, who does what? And with that understanding, again, um, together with the price action itself, we could execute better. Uh, change of behavior and changes of character, extremely important concept. We're going to cover it in the next class. That's how it's important. We, we're going to do that uh, type of uh, coverage almost instantly. And then uh, different uh, type of uh, schematics uh, for, the, for the price structural analysis. So schematics are extremely important and they are extremely popular, but highly misunderstood. Um, why would I say so? Well, because in a lot of cases, what I'm seeing is uh, students are using schematics incorrectly. They are trying to figure out every movement by the schematic. And I've created the schematics for stock charts, the ones that are kind of like, uh, you know, uh, been spread out everywhere. And I'm going to tell you one secret. As I was creating them, I was thinking conceptually, but I was not thinking in terms of like, this is the exact path that should happen. So a lot of the students or a lot of the traders I see on the social media are using those, you know, one-to-one. -one. And even though conceptually that might be a correct thing to do, but uh, you definitely cannot use it for smaller swings. That's number one. And secondly, there are so many variations as to how the accumulation or distribution might happen. You need to keep this in mind. All right. Let's go into the studies of the price cycle. So this is a basic price cycle schematic that identifies four uh, points in this price cycle. The first point is the accumulation area. What ha What is happening in the accumulation area? I would characterize uh, accumulation area as the exchange of shares uh, between strong hands and weak hands. As we are concluding our downtrend, the weak hands are in the capitulation mode. They are capitulating just because uh, they have bought somewhere uh, earlier uh, in the uh, maybe in the uptrend, maybe during the distribution, and maybe in the early stages of the downtrend. And as the price goes down and increases the velocity and the momentum with which the price moves down, uh, emotionally they can't withstand this pressure and they're starting to capitulate. This capitulation produces increasing the velocity to the downside, increasing the downward momentum. It increases the Excuse me, it increases the downward spread. Um, with that, the volume specifically supply is increasing as well. Now, at this point of time, the price has been in the downtrend for some time. So we come into some kind of deeply oversold condition where there is a lot of value. And this value is for a very, very specific institutional type to take. Uh, we are going to call them composite operator, composite man. We are going to call them the value investors. We are going to call them also contrarian traders. So they are basically saying that um, there is a deviation from the fair value of this asset and now it's oversold. So I'm going to come in and because the weak hands are not only going to produce 
uh, lower prices and some kind of therefore value for those contrarian um, composite operator um, uh, types. But it's also gonna produce, their selling is gonna produce the liquidity that is required by those big institutions to be in the market. They cannot come into the stock that doesn't have that increased liquidity. If there is no increase of the liquidity on the selling side, then if they will start buying, the price will just jump up. And that's not what they wanna do. Their primary goal in during the accumulation will be accumulation of the asset in the lower part of the trading range, in the lower part of the consolidation. But the initial buying is going to happen at what we're going to call a terminal event, uh, which is the stop in action, which is the selling climax. So in during the selling climax, we're going to experience some aggressive selling by weak hands, so therefore supply is increasing, and aggressive buying by strong hands. So this is where demand is increasing. This will lead to the uh, climactic volume signature. So this would mean that, uh, you know, that definition of the stop in selling climax type of action is gonna be always associated with increasing the volume signature. Uh, this is a conventional definition of the selling climax. When we're gonna study, I'm gonna show you examples where selling climax or rather stop in action does not require climactic volume signature. And this is, again, is gonna be a very, very important variation on this particular event. Then uh, with this initial stop in action and continuation of the buying by strong hands, we are producing what we are gonna call a change of behavior. A change of behavior is suggestive of the change of the environment. So now from the downtrend, we're gonna convert into some kind of consolidation or a trading range. And this is where our Wyckoff and mines are gonna be working uh, 24 seven. The biggest question that we're gonna have is what is the bias of this trading range? The bias will be defined by the price and volume action uh, during the consolidation. We also will be uh, answering the question of timing. Uh, what is the correct most efficient timing for us to come in into this position? And that has to be during the emergence of the new trend. Um, so in the emergence of the new trend will be associated with the change of behavior of its own, which will be converted into the change of behavior. And we'll talk about the differences between the change of character and the change of behavior. Those are two different things. And with this emergence of the uptrend, we're going to observe uh, other forces coming in uh, into uh, the correct side of the price cycle. We're going to call them institutional trend followers. Those are hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds, insurance companies, any type of registered investor, uh, investor advise, advisors, uh, people that are money managers and that have uh, together a substantial amount of money um, and whose models are all oriented on this particular event, the emergence of the uptrend. And once we have both sides, the contrarian uh, value investor uh, who uh, absorbs uh, a lot of shares in the lower part of the trading range, and then institutional trend followers who are observing the shares now on the way up, that is what creating the change. And that is what creating this emergence uh, of a new uptrend. And with that, once supply is in strong hands, we're going into the markup phase, which is basically an uptrend. During this markup phase, we could have uh, areas uh, that are overboard, areas where we have some kind of uh, a consolidation, which we will call a reaccumulation. Uh, in the principles of the analysis for bias time and the character is going to be the same. Uh, and they're going to be associated with the change of behavior and change of character, and then continuation to the upside. And it's in the upper, in the uh, last parts of the tr uh, of the uptrend, where we would start seeing a couple of interesting things. First of all, weak hands participation is going to increase, and they will become buyers at this point uh, because the tape has advertised the uptrend. Uh, there is such a strong confirmation of the continuation, uh, so they start opening the position and start making money. And with that, we can't uh, get excited and that excitement leads to uh, increased liquidity. And remember how liquidity was so important at the stop in action. Liquidity is also important during the distributional process itself. 
the uh, strong hands need to advertise the trend in such a way that will allow the weak hands to be confident and to put more money into the market. And once this happens, the strong hands and the first strong hands that are going to do this are going to be those value CO type uh, institutions. They're going to start selling and they're going to start distributing. Uh, their shares into uh, weak hands that are making money and are excited about that. And with that, uh, selling a stopping action will be produced as a buying climax, and then we're going to go into a change of behavior. And uh, that would be suggestive of the consolidation. And as consolidation unfolds, more selling, more selling, more selling, more selling, that does not allow the price uh, to go and follow through to the upside. Uh, would create some kind of distributional top information. And then as the price deteriorates and as the relative strength deteriorates, um, institutional trend followers um, as strong hands are going to start giving up their positions and they're going to identify their points of exit. And that's what's going to start producing sign of weaknesses, weak rallies, and then gaps down. Uh, we'll go in more details uh, through this model, but these are the four primary uh, attributes of any price cycle. Uh, so let's go and dig kind of deeper. So what are we going to have during the trading range? So are there specific phases, specific events, specific periods of time that would allow us to uh, dissect the trading range into the understanding of what is going on, what kind of bias we have, when is the price ready to leave the trading range, and what kind of character of the price movement we might potentially have uh, uh, of the price coming out of this trade range. So I would characterize the whole trading range or the whole phases into the stop in action itself, then preparation uh, for the new trend to unfold or for the continuation of the trend, and then actual you know green light for that trend to start and uh, if we are talking about phase analysis we will have different phases phase a which is going to be all about the stop in action right so what do we do here weak hands are selling uh, supply is increasing as i've stated before strong hands are coming in and they see in value so they're starting to buy so demand is increasing Together, that produces an enormous increase in the volume signature, and uh, that's why we have the stopping action, which we're going to call the selling climax. Those are the traits and characteristics of the selling climax. Automatic rally is going to be the best rally uh, in the downtrend or in the last uh, downswing, and that would be suggestive of the change of behavior. A change of behavior would automatically suggest that uh, we might change the uh, environment from, uh, let's say, a trading environment, which is the downtrend in this case, into the non-trading environment, which is the consolidation. And it's during the consolidation that we're going to go through different phases. So we've just described phase A. Phase B is all going to be um, about the intentionality of phase B is all going to be about uh, the uh, exhaustion between the interaction of supply and demand. Um, and originally, um, I mean, I was taught that this is all about core, uh, the course building, uh, and we'll talk about the causality in, in, in the second class. Um, I would disagree with this. I think that the buildup of the course is more of the consequence uh, of the uh, exhaustion of the first phase A and the early phase B, because this is where volatility is the highest. This is where exchange of shares is gonna be enormous. And then we're gonna have some kind of exhaustion by both buyers and sellers. And the price is gonna somewhat drift to the upside and to the downside, depending you know, on who is maybe like slightly dominant uh, throughout the structure. And then going into phase C, um, we are producing uh, the last test of the supply and we're testing all of the supply points in the lower part of the trading range. Is there more supply left? Are there are more weak hands who are willing to give up their shares uh, if the price, let's say, uh, dips below the support? 
Uh, and this is another point reminiscent of the selling climax where uh, composite operators, strong institutional hands will be willing to step in and to buy. Why would they do this? Well, again, low price, high liquidity uh, event. Uh, so they would come in, uh, they would buy, and that would absorb the supply and that would stop the price from going further uh, down. And that would reverse the price above the support uh, and return it back into the trading range. Now, by the time this whole process in the lower part is concluded by the CEO, by the value investor, um, the supply or the majority of the supply or the main part of the supply uh, will be in strong hands. And therefore, the price is going to start traveling up in a different way. It's going to be a different behavior uh, where there is some kind of ease of movement to the upside or there is some kind of urgent demand that pushes the price aggressively. And for the first time, a sign of strength rally will push the price through the whole trading range and above the resistance points that were created in phases A and B. And that will be characterized by us as a change of behavior. And this is what we would be looking for. Um, and it seems like so easy just because uh, I'm giving you like the highlights of the characteristics and so on and so forth. But go figure it out when the rally actually happens that this is a sign of strength rally. Not only you have to look at the uh, result of it, but you have to look at the character of it. You have to look at the confirmation and so on and so forth. Well, confirmation of the change of behavior will come on the back on that action, which is the reaction in itself. It could be in the form of the trading range as well. And this is something that shows us that the price no longer comes back to the support level. So there is no weakness of the demand uh, behind this reaction. And uh, there is some absorption of the supply at the higher level. That's what the backing up action and specifically phase D is showing us. And from the change of behavior, we're transitioning into the change of character, into the change of character of the price structure. Now, from the consolidation, we are transitioning into the uptrend. The distribution will happen in the same way. As I've described, you know, the first phase A, the intention behind that is all about stopping. Stopping of what? Stopping of an uptrend. This is where strong hands uh, or value investors are gonna be selling into the strength of weak hands. And uh, weak hands here uh, for the first time in the price cycle are gonna be profitable. So there is a lot of excitement um, in the last speculative wave. And that's why those speculative waves are like that. They are driven by the control of the supply by strong hands and by excitement of weak hands. And so together, um, it produces an immense uh, momentum uh, move uh, that concludes again with the strong hands selling into the strength that stops the price from further uh, movement to the upside in a buying climax event that produces further a change of behavior as selling continues. And now there is some synchronicity uh, between the selling itself and the movement of the price to the downside. The change of behavior is suggestive of the trading range environment, uh, a switch from the uptrend to the consolidation. And then off we go again through the uh, different stages of stopping preparation and then emergence of the new downtrend. Institutional trend following uh, hands are going to be uh, using their models to get out of the position on the deterioration of the absolute performance by the asset or the stock and also relative performance. Uh, so they will go two quarters or two quarters plus without any uh, um, outperformance and they will um, uh, get rid of that particular position or will start aggressively trimming it. All right, well, in reality, of course, we're going into you know much more detailed looks, right, uh, of the price cycle because we can't really say like, oh, okay, well, this is the price cycle. It is, but it doesn't have a lot of details to this. Usually, you know, a theoretical model that is gonna be somewhat, you know, harder so with more details is gonna look something like this. So you are gonna have your original accumulation. You are gonna have uh, multiple reaccumulation zones, which are a part of an uptrend. So we're always going to have a move to the upside into the short-term overbought condition where there is some profit taken, which coincides 
together, and this is also a very important point, but I'm not going to go into the details of this, of the exchange of shares between uh, CO and uh, institutional trend followers. Again, this is a very important point for the reaccumulation, but this is something that we will be discussing in the next class. And then throughout the whole um, ending of the reaccumulation structure, we are usually going to see diminishing supply signature or some variations where supply might increase, but there is no result to the downside. Those interpretations we're going to go through a lot, either with our homework or in class exercises. So I will show you exactly how to see that and how to interpret that. And then as we go through the uptrend, different uh, points of the, you know, let's say like short-term overbought condition, short-term oversold condition, we will be learning how to trade those, right? So would we take some profit in the overbought condition? Would we add to the position during the reaccumulation consolidation in the short-term oversold condition? Where exactly would we do that? Uh, there are quite a few spots there, uh, around four points of entry uh, that we are identifying structurally where we would be uh, entering. And some of them are higher probability points of entry than others. So we need to you know, develop this type of the understanding. And then as the uh, terminal stopping action happens, we go through the distribution. And then on the way down, we might have the same type of stopping actions, which we call redistributions. And here the logic is the same. Um, so it's just the understanding of who is actually selling at the top. So I'm going to say, okay, CO. Who's selling in the emergence of the uptrend? Um, I'm going to say uh, early um, uh, institutional uh, market participants, uh, which are institutional trend followers. But this is what I would call smart money. Because they could identify with their model systems the emergence of the new environment. Uh, so this to me is smart. Uh, value investment, uh, sell, buying you know, at the bottom of the accumulation range or selling at the top of the accumulation uh, uh, distribution range is foundational to the change of the environment. Um, so they are agents of change to me, um, agents of change. Whereas institutional trend followers, uh, especially early institutional trend followers, uh, they are smart money because they could see early on what's going on. And then as we go down, you're going to uh, have late institutional capitulation, you're going to have uh, general capitulation and so on and so forth. Something that, again, we're going to go through in more details in upcoming classes. Well, here is an example of the price cycle. This is Apple. This is a monthly chart. Um, and here, I just want to show you that uh, there is a principle within the principle. So Hank Pruden always would bring this concept. A principle within the principle. What does it mean? It means on, on a higher time frame, you could observe the same concept as you can observe on the lower time frame. Uh, so in here, we're seeing a quite substantial trading range, a multi-year trading range, um, almost uh, not necessarily multi-decade, but close to that, right? And you might be saying like, well, is it really possible uh, that all of this is an accumulation? Well, um, I could have two answers uh, for you, yes and no. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably reserve the yes question, you know, to later. But no is I'm going to say that if I would divide this trade range into different parts, so one, two, and then three, you could easily identify different type of behaviors in this trade range. And this is going to be one of the things that we're going to be discussing in this course and in the practicum as well. It's this switch from one behavior to another, even in the trading range itself. That is going to be so important for us to observe and also deduce what is going on. Well, what is what's going on with Apple? Well, um, right here, uh, there was an announcement that Steve Jobs is coming back. Um, and uh, I believe it was 87, 88 when he left. 
And then the company went nowhere uh, after his departure, right? So we see in an attempt to continue to the upside failure, and then that failure, uh, you know, creates a, a you know weakness uh, and weaker environment, uh, which is kind of like a local downtrend in a, in a much larger structure. Uh, Steve Jobs com comes back. First of all, we start seeing institutional participation. We start seeing uh, manifestation of that institutional participation in the price action, where the price travels throughout the whole trading range uh, to the new high. Um, and behind it, there is uh, confirmation that institutions are present. Uh, we are seeing this from the increase of the volume signature, which is extremely important. Deviation from this trend by the market uh, events in 2000, 2001 outperformance in the next uh, trading range throughout 2002, 2003, and then resumption of the uptrend. Um, and then again, look at the volume signature. We still see a lot of institutional types coming in into this position. So when people tell me that accumulation or distribution is only a horizontal train, uh, trading range event, um, I instantly know their level of the understanding of the methodology. Uh, you have to know that there are accumulations by institutions on the way up. All of this here is institutional accumulation. I would tell you even more. The volume signature is still relatively high in this area. So they are still accumulating. This is just a late institutional accumulation on the way up. So that kind of questions the whole premise, original premise of how do the price structures are created by institutional buying or selling, or rather institutional accumulation or institutional distribution? It's a very complex uh, uh, process, and sometimes it requires a lot of time. So here we're seeing that from 97 to around 2013, all of this could be called an accumulation. And it just happens in different structural spots, whether this is in the extremely over, uh, oversold condition, extreme long-term value, again, here in 2001, 2002, 2003, or on the way up. Um, so those distinctions are extremely important to us. And then uh, within this larger secular price cycle, which is still unfolding for Apple, we're seeing smaller, shorter price cycles that would have their accumulation trading ranges, that would have the markups, that would have distributional uh, top, that would have the downtrend, that would start again with the accumulation, markup, distribution, markdown, accumulation, markup, distribution, markdown, and so on and so forth. You could find this type of, uh, let's skip this. Ooh, okay. Da, da, da. All right, you could find uh, this price cycles also on the lower time frame, and I'm going to show you those examples as well. Okay, so I want to point your attention really quickly on the weekly newsletter that we have, Wyke of Analytics newsletter. Uh, so usually we are publishing on the weekly basis through the newsletter our market updates. Those are the um, pieces, analytical pieces that we post throughout the week. If you would like to be informed about our analysis right away, it's from the Twitter uh, that we are going to, um, where we are posting a lot of that analysis. Our uh, Twitter handle if, uh, is Wyckoff Analysis, so check this out. Also, I would highly suggest finding our YouTube channel, which is called Wyckoff Trading Method, and checking out uh, all of the videos that we have. Uh, in there, uh, there are some legacy videos um, on the method itself. Uh, there are some educational videos uh, you know, from classes like this one. Uh, there are market updates uh, as well that you could find um, on the weekly basis. So check it out. Behavioral market analysis. What is it? It's the studies of market participants' behaviors in the context of a price structure. Please note that behavioral finance is studying slightly different um, uh, uh, material. Okay, so to us, it's very important to identify who are the market participants. And we will 
define market participants, uh, we'll put them into different categories. So one of the categories is going to be strong hands versus weak hands. Uh, what is the uh, what are the strong hands? Any investor or a trader who is trading in harmony with the price cycle movement. And the weak hands is any investor or trader who is trading in disharmony uh, with the price cycle movement. So where would we see this discrepancy uh, between, let's say, strong hands behavior and weak hands behavior? Well, we said that uh, at the conclusion of the downtrend, at the selling uh, climax point event, we're going to have the extreme point of fear and capitulation by weak hands, and we also are going to see the first signs of intelligent accumulation by strong hands. And it could come even earlier than the selling climax. Uh, the strong hands could be buying, let's say, at the point which we are going to call a preliminary support. Pre preliminary support is that first intelligent uh, sign of accumulation that fails, uh, where the price still goes down. But um, big institutional types could afford the price to go down uh, without closing the position because the way how they enter the position, and by the way, I forgot to mention that um, I am the co-manager of the hedge fund. So it's kind of visible to me in the way how we conduct uh, our trading um, in the hedge fund. We would not necessarily open a full-sized position right away. It will take us some time to accumulate that position, even though it could be a really small percent uh, of the trading equity that we have. It's just because usually institutional types are going to have a lot of money. I mean, like I'm talking about not just millions, I'm talking about like billions and in some cases trillions of dollars. And it's not that all of this money is going to go into one position or one stock. Uh, it's usually diversified between the themes then within those themes, uh, there is a diversification on the leaders and laggards. Uh, and there is uh, always some kind of rotation based on what is outperforming and what is underperforming. So it's a complex operation, uh, especially when you have a lot of money. Um, and uh, with that, the, you know, our first point of discrepancy here is going to be uh, at the conclusion of the downtrend. Uh, then as we go into the emergence of the uptrend, uh, we're going to identify early institutional trend adopters uh, that are adopting the new trend, right? So there is emergence of the trend and these early institutional adopters uh, uh, are using specific systems and models that they have developed or that they subscribe to that identify the change of behavior. Uh, it's kind of funny uh, that you know, all of us uh, describe the events, uh, the same event in different words, but we're talking about the same thing. So this emergence of the uptrend could be described by different methodologies. Let's say if we're taking just the technical analysis, it could be described by Elliott wave, it could be described by uh, Wyckoff method, it could be described by the Dow theory um, and, you know, conventional Edwardson McGee type of patterns. Um, so uh, but to me, any method is uh, um, any method, you know, has the right to exist if it describes the truth about the transitions of the market, uh, and uh, if it describes correctly the transition between different structures. Uh, so to me, it just becomes a point of preference. Like, what do you prefer? Do you prefer the explanation of the Wyckoff method of the explanation of the Elliott way. And there are definitely some pros and cons uh, for, the, uh, for this method or for that method, you know, personal preferences and so on and so forth. But uh, good methodologies uh, that stick the truth about the, how the market unfolds, they all will describe the same event in the same way, um, just using different terminology. So here at the emergence of the trend, early institutional trend adopters are jumping on board, uh, that consumes the supply even more and advances the price even more. So there's a lot of momentum characteristics off the bottom of any type of accumulation. And then um, the weak hands are become inactive or they are selling uh, with the hope that there's gonna be some kind of continuation of the downtrend. The psychology of this is that the weak hands are really exhausted after the loss that they have had. 
uh, they are exhausted by the trading range because during the trading range, their behavior is somewhat sporadic. Uh, they're thinking that there's going to be some kind of continuation to the downside. So they're short, they make some money, but the price reverses and then they uh, close at break even or at the loss. And this in and out, in and out during the trading range really exhausts them. So by the time there is an emergence of the, uh, uh, of the trend, they are basically out. Um, you know, they're just emotionally not capable of continuing, you know, to analyze and to be active in this position. As the markup develops, the next, the next deviation in the behavior between the strong and weak hands is going to be at the stop in action, which is the buying climax. Um, here, we're going to find the first signs of the intelligent distribution by strong hands and the extreme point of excitement by weak hands talking about you know the discrepancy the, the differences between you know two camps weak hands and strong hands uh, strong hands are selling into strength that stops the price uh, from going further up and one might ask well why is it that strong hands has this capacity to stop the trend well just because they have so much money and that when they actually start distributing it's not an insignificant amount of money it's not the amount of money that could be easily observed by uh, excitement of weekends. Uh, so therefore, um, with that, there, there are some bars that we're going to have, like in the swing at the end of the swing, where we see climactic behavior as the weak hands are driving the price up with a lot of increase of the momentum. And yet the volume signature increases and we're seeing a lot of volume spikes. What does that tell us? that there is some kind of presence of the supply. And gradually, this presence of the supply or consistent selling will create some kind of top information that will see first deterioration of the upward result, where upward result will be diminishing. And then we'll see the increase of the downward result. And this increase of the downward result will be associated with the value buying by weak hands what they perceive as value. They will be perceiving the value at any of the reactional lows right here, and they will be buying. And that's why the volume signature sometimes is increasing at those spots. And yet at the same time, with the, it's gonna be associated with the distribution on the way down by strong hands. Um, and that's, that's the whole process. So our key um, in this class and just in general, in our analysis and in our trading is to identify those areas uh, where specific market uh, participants are behaving in a specific way uh, and observe that behavior and deduce what's the true intention behind that behavior and to trade, execute alongside, um, you know, the strong money, the agent of uh, uh, change type of money, and also the uh, smart money. All right, let's look now uh, at the price cycle from the point of view of the behavior of those uh, market participants. So this is an idealized, um, a strong institutional hands behavior. And I put institutional here um, as something that we could easily take out because it's not just the institutional, but you know, retail hands could be strong hands. Um, and we should be taking proud, uh, pride um, in the ability uh, to recognize um, the behavior by institutions and to trade alongside. Uh, so uh, every time you have a successful trade that is not uh, you know, an accidental trade, but where you truly, truly understand uh, the behaviors behind institutions and how you trade it uh, alongside them, you should pat yourself on the back and just you know, say, yeah, I'm, I was acting as a strong hand in this particular trade. So what would they do? As the prices fall, they will be buying. So this is that contrarian buying, right, at the uh, bottom of the trading range. As there is an emergence of the trend, they would be buying on the way up. And as we saw in, with Apple example, they could be buying on the way up for years if this is a long-term campaign. Um, and then at some point of the trend, the volume signature, the institutional volume signature will go down. So what does it mean? This means that no longer they are seeing this as a very attractive opportunity and they are just allowing the trend uh, to continue going up, uh, but they are not gonna be aggressively participating in this trend. So they become inactive in the latest part 
uh, of the upfront. And then when the weekends are going to get excited, they're going to start selling uh, as the price rallies, and that will uh, provide the stopping uh, effort uh, to stop the price. And with that, the top information unfolds, and as there is a deterioration of the price and the relative uh, performance, they will be selling by capitulating their positions. And that's what usually is going to produce those big, quick moves down. And that's why the downtrends usually have more velocity, uh, higher momentum signature, and so on and so forth. On the opposite side, the weak hands, and again, you know, I put here institutional weak hands, and it's not just institutional, but retail as well. They will be selling by capitulating into the general terminal uh, climax. And uh, these are not smart money, uh, even if they are institutional money. Uh, these are big losses for institutions uh, when they are selling into the terminal selling climax. And usually they're going to be associated on the institutional side with inability to get out of the position. Uh, just because there is a lot of money, uh, the price is moving really fast, and you can't get out uh, with this type of size. Um, as the consolidation unfolds, they still could be selling um, as, uh, as they are um, thinking that there's going to be some kind of continuation. And then based on all of the losses that they have developed in both areas, they will become extremely inactive during the emergence of the new uptrend. It's just, you know, a very natural human, um, you know, flight to safety. Um, and I want to reiterate that it's an emotional driven behavior uh, where uh, people after a series of losses in one asset usually go away from that. Um, they don't want to look at that. They don't want to be reminded of the pain that they went through. Uh, just because, you know, their perception of the self, you know, dictates specific self-talk and so on and so forth. All right. So with that, they are not participating. But then once the price come, uh, goes into the second part of the trend, into more speculative parts of the trend, where the price moves much faster, easier, with some keys, kind of ease of movement, they will get back on this trend. And this is, again, is going to be the time when the weak hands are going to be making money. And this is what's so exciting about the speculative phase. And, uh, you know, the sentiment of this speculative phase is easily identifiable. Go to any type of breadth or not necessarily breadth, but sentiment indicators or uh, social media. Uh, and you will hear, you will sense this excitement by weekends as they are making money. And as they are making money and creating, you know, points of liquidity, strong hands are starting to sell. That creates the trading range uh, of the distributional nature. And then every reaction uh, in their original distribution and a regional um, downtrend are going to be perceived by weekends as an opportunity of value. So they're going to come in here and they're going to say, yeah, this has been um, a leading stock. And now it's at the discount of 20% or 30% or even 50%. Is it worth buying? Yes, so I'm gonna buy it. So that's the mentality of weak hands. And with that, they will start losing money again and all of the money that they won uh, in during the speculative phase, they're gonna lose. Um, so that's kind of like this idealized model. Uh, let's look at the examples of this. Uh, the same uh, uh, Apple case study, uh, monthly, basis. I've mentioned to you that the volume signature is going to be very indicative where big institutional types are. How come? Well, um, the question here that we might ask is, is this weekend's signature? Is this maybe even, let me just put it this way, in a more legacy conventional way, is this a retail uh, public type of volume signature? No. Who would produce so much volume? Only institutions are capable of producing this type of volume signature that is substantially higher than the volume, average volume signature that we've seen before. I mean, this is times two, times two and a half. Um, so therefore, we know that institutions are present here. Then the next question becomes is, what is the result of this institutional presence? And we're seeing how the price is actually having the best rally in this trading range. 
So with that, we know that a change of behavior is happening. They know something we don't know. And I mean, obviously, this knowledge comes later on to us. It's been delivered to us you know, through different sources. Um, but they knew something, and their models are saying that they need to be in. So this is what they're doing. And then, uh, again, as the prices fall, again, this is market-driven fall right here, we see accumulation on the way down. So the price does not go to the new lower low, but goes to the higher low. And then after that, buying on the way up, buying on the way up. So those are institutional trend followers that are identifying this particular stock or theme, uh, in this case, I would say the stock, as the leadership stock, as the stock that is capable of the long-term campaign that would multiply their money, not just like, you know, twofold, fourfold. I mean, like for the duration of uh, many years, uh, they might be staying in this position. And we know a lot of funds like that. Um, and then they become inactive. Uh, they become inactive when they are fully in the position. You could see this from the volume signature very uh, expansive volume signature, then we go down, but still relatively high. So they're still buyers at this point, and then nothing after that. So that's a very significant volume event uh, that we would be observing and making some kind of you know, deductions as to what is uh, happening with the institutional types. And they are just loaded up, um, and they are just riding the trend, and that's what's happening. Now, this trend, or the price cycle rather, um, could happen on a lower time frame. So here is an example uh, of principle within the principle. So we I was showing you a big, large price cycle, and here I'm showing you a smaller price cycle. This is still relatively big in terms of the time frame. This is on the weekly. So we have a trading range announcement uh, about Steve Jobs, I believe, comes right here. And then we're seeing how the demand signature has increased, how there was some buying on the way down uh, prior to that, how there was a stop in action. And um, we're seeing that after that, there is a lot of demand that is coming in as the price moves up, as the price consolidates and doesn't follow through to the downside, but holds and then continues to the upside. So all of that um, are the characteristics of a bullish behavior where uh, institutions are present, therefore they are increasing demand and uh, for this particular stock. And that's what's pushing the price up. And it's pushing the price up in a specific way. There is a specific way of how the price moves. So for instance, I would say that this movement right here is much better than this one just because it has some elements of the supply, whereas this is more sustainable and there is uh, you know, uh, a much more logical way uh, of, for the speed with which the price moves, for the demand that is coming in, and so on and so forth. This is a little bit more advanced, so we're not going to discuss it here, but later on we'll definitely touch on that. And then a distributional uh, structure. Again, this was more of a market-driven event. We'll discuss this particular a uh, case study where the volume is going down and market participants become inactive, but um, there is one point of interest to us. As they become inactive, they still hold on to their positions. And that's what produces this general capitulation right here. Uh, but that was specific to the market price cycle itself. And if we go to even a lower time frame, what if we go to, let's say, two hour time frame? What would we see? Would we see the same price cycle? And indeed we do, right? So we are uh, identifying original areas of the accumulation. We are identifying changes of, of character and changes of behavior. Uh, and we are uh, seeing how on the way down as the volume increases, there is some increased demand. So there is some buying on the way down. There is some buying on the way down again. Uh, and then as the price starts to go up above the structure, we see the increase in the demand. And this is the moment of what I call a synchronicity. Expanding upward effort is being synchronized by the expanding result. And therefore, this is not just suggestion, but the confirmation of the bullish behavior. And then as we approach um, 
you know, some kind of distributional formations. We are going to have some selling by institutions, um, some inactivity, uh, preferably in phases A, I'm sorry, in phases B, uh, and then selling into strength again until the point of where selling or the downward effort increase is going to synchronize with the downward uh, result. And that uh, would be conclusive of the bearish behavior. So these cycles repeat themselves. It's just that variations on the price stru structure and variation on the volume signature and variation on the interaction between the price and the volume are different. And that's what's so hard um, you know, about trading just in general. Okay, where are we? 455. Okay, let's go through the characteristics and the traits of the market participants. So I've mentioned to you the institutional contrarian investor. This is our ultimate composite operator. This is somebody like Warren Buffett who comes in uh, as as the prices are going down and going down, you know, significantly in some kind of selling climax type of character, right? So increase of the downward spread, increase of the volume signature to the downside. Weak hands are in panic; they're capitulating. Um, it's the value investor, and usually that would be a value methodology that has a huge size and uh, who uh, who has a very also prolonged time horizon for their investment. Again, think about Warren Buffett, how he would hold on to stocks for you know over 20 years. Um, so it's a cyclical, uh, uh, secular to cyclical time frame. This is not very common for um, average public investor or trader. What are they looking for? They're looking for long-term value because they are looking for long-term trends, but they're also looking for short-term liquidity. And this is where a Wyckoff methodology actually is so valuable because we could identify those Wyckoff events that create that short-term liquidity based on weak hands selling or buying. And they're obviously looking for the contrarian sentiment um, and not just a short-term contrarian sentiment, but a very you know, meaningful historical um, uh, contrarian sentiment. Something, think about like COVID-19 low, what kind of sentiment did we have there? and how the contrarian idea works so nicely at that point. And by the way, we called the COVID low literally to the hour. Limitations um, of those uh, big contrarian value investors. They're just too big. So sometimes too big is good, sometimes too big is bad. In, in the case of, let's say, selling or buying, that might be problematic for them because of their size. They also insist on low turnover. I mean, just being, you know, a hedge uh, hedge fund co-manager, you all constantly, you know, being uh, poked at uh, your turnover ratio, uh, just because um, it creates uh, more of the uh, overhead expenses. Uh, it creates the volatility of the portfolio. So usually the preference of the investors that give you the money is that you don't rotate portfolio too much too quickly. Um, tax implications. Well, that is something that is changing constantly. And um, uh, there is uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, more less weight, I would say right now in the on the institutional side about the tax implications. But uh, the whole premise is that the long-term investment is still much more uh, profitable to them from the tax point of view than the short term. Uh, so therefore, their time horizon is being defined by that, um, by those tax implications. Their edge, the time horizon, as I said, they could go through multiple price cycles or the whole price cycle and still be in the position. Uh, their edge is long-term trends. Long-term trends are easier to identify um, and they are much more sustainable but you have to have a thick skin and go through periods of the consolidation which could be a reaccumulation that could last from you know six months to even you know a couple of years and they have a deep knowledge and this deep knowledge comes either from their own understanding of the environment like you know like warren buffett or they're just buying you know really good analytical support uh something that uh, a lot of um, you know public traders uh retail traders cannot even afford um, they are visible on the chart at the points of the extreme volume, at the points of the extreme liquidity. 
uh, at the points of absolute and relative trends and at the point uh, of long-term volume signature. And I've mentioned the examples of those. So this is our first um, type of institutional strong hand, the composite operator. Uh, the second type, institutional trend follower. So again, this is uh, the ones that are usually managing the money. And they manage the money either for some kind of purpose, like pension fund, insurance company, um, uh, or uh, for the purpose of the performance, uh, like hedge funds and registered investment advisors. And uh, they're usually uh, going to be in the growth camp uh, from the methodology point of view. Their size is still relatively big. Uh, they are close to the uh, value investors and the composite men itself. Their time horizon uh, is predominantly cyclical. So they want to go through, let's say, uh, you know, multiple years of price cycle, of price uptrend, and they will be managing their position uh, based on the kind of like uh, local uh, events in the timeline uh, where we go into the uh, overload condition, we have some mini distributions, a mini profit taken that takes the market down 10, 20%, and they uh, reemerge as the buyers at that point. Um, they are looking for the emergence of the trend, the break of the trend, the long term value, and the short term liquidity. Their limitations is all about performance matrix. Remember that they are taking the money from someone else and they need to perform in the marketplace in a specific way um, to increase their assets under management. They are also concerned about the low turnover uh, as the value investor, and they're also concerned about tax implications as well. Uh, their edge is the time horizon uh, itself because it's longer. So they will be in the longer term trends and they also have a lot of knowledge and deep knowledge from analysts. Uh, so definitely uh, quite good edges to have. They are visible on the chart on the absolute and relative trends, long term volume signature. And for this particular type, institutional trend followers, the momentum signature of their presence will be visible. So we will study that as well. Professional traders, those are either helpers, you know, to the first two institutional types, or they are the ones that are uh, trading relatively medium to small size, but still relatively big um, on their own. So they, their strategies are all going to be about momentum and mean reversion. Uh, they are size medium to small. Uh, they are time horizon daily swing, in some cases even intraday. They are looking for short-term overbought, oversold, and short-term momentum. Their limitation is that they have too many trades, high commission, which is not maybe relevant anymore, uh, short-term taxation, and lower size. But their edge is going to be quickness. Uh, they are visible on the chart through the momentum, through the short-term volume, liquidity, and short-term swings. And they are going to be either proprietary traders, retail traders, registered investment advisors, or professional traders that are going to be associated with all of these uh, institutions above. And then the retail trader. And with the retail trader, um, you know, momentum is going to be the king, uh, not even mean reversion. It's all about like, uh, I want to be in the stock or in the asset or in the crypto that is going to be running up, that is going to be uh, showing some momentum. Their size is small, daily swing and intraday. They are looking for momentum breakouts and points of excitement. The, their limitations uh, is mostly they are sentiment driven. Uh, they have lower knowledge um, on them about the market and they have very low skills uh, as to how to conduct um, you know, the operation in the market. Their edge is still quickness and different type of rules that you, know, you could change here and there and uh, it's not gonna uh, produce like you know a big uh, turmoil like it would with institutional trend followers or contrarian investor. Uh, they are not that visible on the chart, but you could identify the places where um, you know retail uh, traders will be more present than not. Um, so indefinitely, you know, the retail uh, traders are s somebody like us. Okay. Um, so if we would go back, uh, you know, to 
uh, our price cycle model, where would we meet all of those groups, right? So we can have strong hands, trend followers. Um, as we go into the selling climax, we expand our selling, value buyers are observing the supply. So the CO is observing the supply and that's what stops the price from moving uh, further down. And that's what uh, triggers the emergence of the trading range. Trend followers, institutional trend followers are still inactive. They do not have to participate in the uptrend when there is no uptrend. So they will start participating when there's going to be some kind of emergence of the uptrend and when the weak hands are going to become inactive and the value buyers or the CO still could be buying on the way up in the initial stages of the uptrend. As we go into any type of reaccumulation, weak hands will be buying, so they will be excited with the short-term opportunity of the momentum, and they will be buying into the overbought condition, which will usually produce some kind of loss or a break-even trade. Value or the uh, composite man could be taking profits, again, based on the overbought short-term condition, and trend followers might be actually buying just because there is not enough liquidity from the profit taken on the value uh, investors. And that will force them to come in and to observe that supply that has been presented by profit taken uh, of uh, value investors. And as we go through the whole trading range here, weak hands will become inactive after the losses. Value buyers are going to come in only off the bottom and trend followers will be buying again. And that's what kind of produces this movement. You know, if you would think about the behaviors of market participants, why they're buying, you know, how does this buying actually is being reflected on the chart, in the price action, um, in the volume signature. You know, you could identify, uh, you know, what is going on from the bias point of view and what is going on from the timing point of view. Um, a much more deeper knowledge and skill to develop is to understand what does it mean uh, for the continuation of the uptrend, what kind of character of the price movement and let's say volume signature you will have going forward um, after you know one or two um, reaccumulations. Then during the distribution, weak hands will be buying on the way up. As we stated, weak hands will be buying at the short-term points of value in the distributional range and uh, they will perceive this as a good selection just because of the prior uptrend and i'm sure some of you are thinking like oh my gosh i do exactly that and we all have done that you know one of the things about our community is the recognition not of just our present mistakes but of our our past mistakes we routinely go into the analysis of how we traded and how we are trading right now it's an extremely important skill to develop an extremely important observation and an extremely important deduction about our own behaviors in a marketplace that we need to gain. Um, while the weak hands are enjoying the short-term value opportunities that temporarily produce some kind of positive you know, result, but they all fail, uh, the trend followers could be buying as well as an opportunity to continue with this trend, uh, with, the, with this trade but they will start selling once this performance starts deteriorating on the absolute basis on, on the relative basis. And this is a very important change of behavior, not only for them, but in the price structure in general. So our goal is just to basically catch that. Value investor or the CEO becomes inactive just because it's sold, it's sold, it's sold, it's sold, it's sold on the way uh, down and it's out of the position. And then, uh, you know, early institutional trend following hands are going to sell, and that's going to push the price down in the first break. Uh, weak hands are going to uh, think that in the area of the redistribution, this is an opportunity to buy again. Uh, composite man is going to be inactive, and then trend followers could be inactive um, at this point, and they become active as sellers now. They are shorting. Uh, and they're taking opportunity of the downtrend once the trend has been established. The composite min is not necessarily there. There's no need for the composite uh, operator to short only for hedging purposes. Um, they could be in the assets that are uh, counter-trending to, let's say, the, the overall trend. 
and therefore their selection could be based on a different model altogether. Whereas weekends are continuing to buy. They are still seeing this redistribution as the value zone. So uh, again, if you um, you know ever think about like the stock that had a big uptrend and then a huge change of behavior and then does this, you're usually going to be caught up in the emotion of what has happened before and not in the emotion of what has happened, what is happening right now. Okay, and then the price cycle starts again when we have the terminal selling climax, the last selling climax, and then we cancel selling like they did here. And then uh, the CO is buying and the trend followers are uh, becoming inactive until the emergence um, of an uptrend. And we go through this over and over and over again. So the key here for us is just to understand this process, understand how we see this on the chart, understand what's behind this process in terms of the market participants, uh, exhibiting specific intentions at the specific structural spots, and then uh, confirming this analysis with how the price structure develops, and then understanding what are the best uh, interactive execution points for us on the chart to initiate the positions, to initiate stop losses, and then you know move those stop losses and uh, take profits also at the appropriate places. So how is this visible on the chart? Let's kind of like have a look again. Uh, this is Apple daily, uh, 2011, 12, 13. So it has you know the price cycle structure built in. So we're going through the accumulations and then through the distribution and then through the downtrend and then through the accumulation again. So here's your price cycle. What do we see in the um, initial trading range? We're seeing a lot of volume spikes. What, do they, uh, what does it mean uh, you know, with those volume spikes? Um, it means that there is an increased institutional activity uh, during those days or during those number of days. The second question that we need to address, what is the result of this institutional activity? And we're seeing how every time the price stops and creates some kind of horizontal uh, uh, price deviation around the mean. So that usually would tell us with the increased institutional activity and the inability of the price to follow through to the downside, um, this is a bullish behavior and what is it? suggestive uh, it's suggestive of absorption of uh, shares um, and continuation to the upside a rally that we're seeing uh, you know some buying on the way up which looks momentum rally so institutional trend followers are accumulating on the way up and then the second trading range where we still have those elements of buying as the price goes down and obviously in 2011 uh, especially in the second part of it, in August, uh, uh, September, no October, November, we've had uh, the market going down about 20%, staying in the trading range. So Apple is showing relative and absolute performance uh, where the price advances better than the market and relatively and comparatively better than the market. Uh, so it shows, again, not just presence of institutions, but that they are favoring Apple in this uh, structure to advance and to outperform the market. And what an outperformance we have here, where uh, we are seeing more demand is coming in, and those are already different type of institutions. The CEO would never be buying like this on the way up, uh, substantially away from the structure. But institutional trend followers that uh, rely on their momentum models, uh, relative strength models, will be attracted to this. And as the price leaves the trading range, they're gonna be heavy buyers, we see that. And into this buying, we finally see some kind of supply coming in. And this is institutional contrarian investor distributing as the price goes up. And we see this from the increase of the volume signature from the initial slowing down of the momentum and then the change of behavior, the largest reaction. Uh, in the uptrend, which is suggestive that now we are going to go from an uptrending environment and we're going to convert into a trading range environment. This trading range environment is complex. It has some elements of the reaccumulation where supply is going down and we have local higher highs, higher lows. 
that is suggestive of the continuation to the upside. But then when we look at this upside, uh, we are seeing that we are up thrusting. And this up thrust is being associated with local supply spikes. And what is the result of this uh, occurrence of this local supply spikes? The price starts to come back into the trading range and then produces the downswing of larger uh, magnitude. And during this sign of weakness reaction, we're seeing a subsequent increase of the supply, which is even more. So what does it tell us? It tells us that institutions are present here. And if they are present, what is the result of this price action to the downside? So therefore, what is the bias? Bearish. And this is a very kind of like minimalistic analysis that I could conduct, just going to the specific concept that is extremely important for us at this particular uh, you know, uh, structural spot. Um, and then from there, we go into the downtrend with different characteristics and so on and so forth, with general capitulation as the highest level of supply where everybody is given up. Um, after this consolidation, you know, there is no belief that the price will go up. And that's what produces, again, the price cycle where CO comes in and starts buying. And, you know, this repeats over and over and over again. All right. Um, for those of you who are more advanced, I still would suggest uh, to take our Wyckoff Trading course. Uh, but you also could go to more advanced products. Um, uh, this is a very interesting product that um, uh, you know I have with William Riordan, um, a friend and a Wyckoffian, uh, Monday classes uh, on chart reading. Um, we call this the tape reading lab. So we are reading the ticker, right, off the chart. We are reading the tape off the chart. So that's why we're calling this the tape reading. It's not the level one, level two tape reading, uh, far from it. It's more of the chart reading based on the wake of concepts. And um, definitely uh, check out some of the examples of this on our YouTube uh, channel. And I'd be, uh, I'd be probably hesitant if I'm the beginner or intermediate trader uh, to go right away here, just because this is not the class where we solicit your questions. We basically do not talk to the audience. The audience just listens in. Uh, this is the class where two professionals, two uh, white coffins are just talking and having a dialogue about the chart. And we go through the market analysis and just you know some exercises. Uh, but for the advanced trader, I mean, you know, shoot me an email and I'll tell you, like I'll ask you a couple of questions and I'll know your level. Um, I, you know, you could you could join us. All right, uh, coming to the end of the presentation, and uh, you know, I would ask you guys to think about any of the questions that you have at this point especially for those of you who are either students or you guys are gonna sign up. Um, so make sure that uh, you know you use this opportunity and I could answer. Again, your homework, and this is mandatory. Uh, so read the article, Anatomy of the Trade by Jim Forte, and uh, we to a certain degree will discuss it in the next class. Uh, for those of you who are still thinking, should I be signing up? Shoot us an email uh, with any questions that you have. We'll be happy to answer either Nancy or myself. And uh, you know, uh, you have uh, the faster you sign up, the better. Just because you'll start working on the homeworks, but technically you could sign up uh, within the week uh, before the next session or slightly after that. You could catch up. Uh, even with session number three, but my preference uh, for any students is to come in and to start the cycle when it properly starts. And with that, I believe that's it for today. Let's see if we have any questions or any comments. Uh, 
All right, Daniel, you were asking absolute versus relative. Um, so absolute performance is just the price performance and relative performance is the comparative performance to the peers or a group or the market. All right, what else? How can we, uh, how can we subscribe to tomorrow's session? Um, okay, yeah, so uh, go to our website. And under the life education, Wike of Trading Course Part 2, and here is the registration, register here for the free session on April 19th. And that will bring you to the uh, go to webinar registration like you did for this session. If you cannot attend, that's totally fine. Just sign up and we will email you the link to the recording which you could uh, watch later on okay let's see other questions um will you take requests to look at certain tickers during the class for example tesla from hayward um so we have this uh uh format for sure for our students but not in this class there is just too much material and there is so much distraction uh, by people wanting to look at their stocks of interest. So we've created a specific place. This is weekly Wyke of Market discussion with Bruce. And one of the things that you can do here is uh, you could send us your charts and we can analyze those charts for you. Um, so check this out. Um, under which product uh, we could have conversation with with you more from Iskander. Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, like I haven't really thought about it from this point of view. Um, I mean, you, I definitely go through all of your homeworks. I read all of your emails. I mean, sometimes maybe I'm too busy and I'm going to skip a session here and there, but usually uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday classes are all classes where uh, you can reach out to me and uh, you could ask me any question. It's just a matter of what kind of question you are asking. If you're asking about the methodology, something theoretical, then the uh, Monday class would be the best. If you're asking about, uh, um, you know, this symbol, specific symbol, uh, then you definitely better come to the Wednesday class. Uh, and there we would discuss it um, in, in a different way. Uh, but I'm readily accessible, you know, uh, either via email or social media, especially on Twitter. Uh, so check those uh, places out. Uh, could you tell some concepts that need to be read or understood before taking this class? Yes, for sure. So under the free material, uh, go to the resources. And again, I mentioned the anatomy of the uh, trading range article here. So here it is, you could do this. You could also read the Hanks um, uh, article here on the of schematics, but not necessary. Uh, the composite man bull market campaign more is a case study that Hank, Bruce and I uh, conducted, I believe in like 2014. From the books, Wyke of books, again, I do not necessarily ask uh, students to go and read them. Uh, I think uh, there is less value in reading those books if you are just starting with us and there is more value to read them uh, later on once you become more of the intermediate and uh, you know advanced trader. Uh, but the books that I would absolutely recommend is Hank's book, uh, The Three Skills of Top Trading, uh, and David's book, Trades About to Happen. Um, everything else is kind of secondary. Everything else is more about, um, you know, developing specific skill, whether it's like volume analysis or sentiment or uh, price action and so on and so forth. Uh, some technical books that we would advise, but it's also either for, for really, you know, the beginners or, or for somebody who just wants to advance their knowledge. And again, I would, uh, suggest doing this even after the practical. Okay. Uh, any prerequisites uh, for uh, WTCT2? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, WT, uh, WTC1. Um, losing my language here. Uh, 
there are really no prerequisites to this, but if you feel that this is a little bit advanced for you and we have people like this and we've addressed that, uh, the, uh, the basic course that we have Hey guys, I think I'm back. Apologies. Um, I wasn't meeting myself. It's just, um, it was some kind of interruption in my internet connection and it just was off. All right. Well, I mean, we are concluding obviously um, our first class. Um, uh, let me see if there are any other questions. Okay, I think that's it. Um, so, um, again, I would be suggesting that if you are about to sign up uh, for this uh, course, and if you have any questions, email us. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. This, either this is you know, a question about the curriculum or is this the course for me? Is there another path? I really like the like of methodology, so I need to figure out, um, you know, is this the correct thing for me to do or anything administrative um, uh, that relates to you know how to sign up the pricing you know um, you know maybe some packages that you want to buy and so on and so forth uh, okay you were about to say something about the basic course for the very new traders yeah so the basic course is uh, really about the uh, technical analysis concepts and maybe now I could do this really quickly. I apologize, you know, for this disconnect. So under the product catalog, basic chart and course, we've done it together with Bruce. Uh, what does it have? The whole curriculum is here. You could just go through this. Um, We've tried to create the course that is not going to be a course on technical analysis and it's not going to be a course on the Wyckoff 
methodology, but a hybrid. And so kind of like the transition from technical analysis to the Wyckoff methodology. And I thought we did a really good job. There is quite a few themes um, that we discuss here. Each class has some kind of homework, but this is on-demand class. This is not a live class. Uh, so if you feel that you would benefit from this first, I would highly suggest this. Um, but also, uh, you know, just the uh, uh, like a trading course itself will go through the basics of chart reading. So if you know technical analysis, but you're not sure about the Wyckoff method, I would definitely start somewhere here. All right, anything else? Any other questions? Okay, I think that's it. All right, guys. Well, for those of you who are students, um, I'm, uh, definitely go through the homework, read the article, and I'll see you on Monday. For those of you who's gonna sign up, um, you know, shoot us an email, sign up. And for those of you who are just guests, uh, hopefully, you know, there was enough information that you've extracted enough value from this session. Uh, and if you have any further questions in the future, don't hesitate to contact us. With that, thank you guys so much, and I'll see you next Monday. Bye-bye.